Okay, thank you very much for coming today. It's so nice outside. And I forgot my glasses, so I can't really do the Phil Donahue thing so good, but I'll give it a shot. Um, as she said, as Cindy said, I'm Samia Savell. I'm the district conservationist for Southeast Alaska for the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. And I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about high tunnels today. I'm going to um, I have to leave early because I have a class that starts at 1 in the valley, so I'll talk mostly from an a NRCS perspective on, on high tunnels and our high tunnel pilot program, and I'll let um, Susan kind of talk about the allure and romance of using high tunnels for gardening in southeast Alaska. And if you, um, if you didn't already see, on the back table there is a sign-in sheet if you want me to email you some information, um, there's also a stack of cards if you would prefer to um, initiate the email yourself, and that way I'll be sure not to misspell your email address and have you never receive it. Um, and then there's also a, a fact sheet about high tunnels um, for NRCS programs. And so to start off with, I'm going to, um, before I get to high tunnels, I'm going to give a little bit of background on the Natural Resources Conservation Service, uh, just so that you can um, get an understanding of uh, our approach or our perspective on um, the high tunnel program. So can you go ahead and advance? So um, the Natural Resources Conservation Service was established um, initially as the Soil Erosion Service, and then it quickly was renamed to the Soil Conservation Service. And that was established in the early 1930s during the Dust Bowl era when there was a big drought in the West and uh, there was literally soil from the West being blown around the country and um, all the way to Washington, D.C. And so um, the Soil Conservation Service was established to assist farmers and ranchers with uh, implementing best, best management practices to conserve and protect soil resources. And that's uh, what we uh, did for about 60 years. Um, and then in the mid-90s, we changed our name and our scope to the Natural Resources Conservation Service and included all natural resources and trying to help non-federal landowners address natural resources concerns associated with agricultural production. So we're governed and funded by the Farm Bill, which is reauthorized by Congress every five years. And our approach to agriculture is not so much to help people produce food, but really to help, again, address natural resources concerns that come up um, as a result of producing agricultural products. So we do provide planning and technical assistance to address those concerns to um, primarily non-federal landowners, but we do also work with other um, government and public land agencies as well, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Go ahead. So our clients and partners um, include agricultural um, operators, like this farm up in Delta, and um, subsistence users, such as these folks out west who are actually building an ATV trail to access traditional subsistence gathering areas. Um, forest producers uh, is a lot of what the work that I do in Southeast Alaska um, because most of the private land in Southeast is owned by native corporations. So um, the bulk of my work really is with native corporations on second growth management. And then um, native entities, individual landowners. And again, we do partner with um, other government agencies um, and tribal entities. So this is a picture actually of Upper Lemon Creek uh, where I helped develop a sediment transport and hydrologic assessment of Lemon Creek with the city and borough of Juneau. And then we work with nonprofit organizations. Um, these folks are doing a stream bank rehabilitation project on Sawmill Creek and Haynes and other resource agencies and even economic development councils. So it's um, like an inch deep and 45 miles wide. <laughs> so um, and you can move on to the next slide. So the, we have a variety of services and programs that we provide, including um, soil survey 
and we do um, soil surveys throughout the state, mapping soil units um, to help with resource and uh, resource planning and community development and anything related to soil, which is like pretty much everything is related to what's underneath your feet. So, um, and then we do also have snow survey, which we do throughout the state to monitor snowpack um, at a variety of different uh, sites throughout the state. Um, and then technical assistance with landowners. And, and then we have cost share programs that we can help offset the cost of implementing best management practices. And um, the one that I'm going to talk about mostly today is um, the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, which is what the High Tunnel Program is, is funded through. Um, so yeah, we can go. And so again, most of the work that I do in Southeast Alaska um, involves working with native corporations. Um, it's, I cover everything from Yakutat to Metlakatla, so and I'm a one-person office. Um, so if you don't hear back from me, then feel free to email me again or call me. <laughs> um, but uh, I help a lot with um, support and initiation of watershed councils, uh, more so when I started um, 10 years ago than, than I do now. But um, I still work with watershed councils uh, throughout the region, helped initiate and um, continue to participate in the local cooperative weed management area and um, provide technical assistance. And this is just, you know, if you're an individual landowner and you have a resource concern, you can contact me. I don't necessarily know the answer, but I can usually figure out where to get that answer and where to get you the resources um, to, to help you fix it yourself, basically. Um, whether it's to do with water quality or, um, or plant health and vigor on your property or um, a variety of different uh, water, uh, natural resource issues. And I've had uh, several fish passage and wetland enhancement, riparian improvement um, projects throughout the region as well and a smattering of high tunnels so far. Um, and again, with the forest management, I have more than 30,000 acres of second growth treatments with native corporations since 2006 that are either completed or underway. So that's the bulk of, that's like the five cent tour of, of uh, the projects that I do in the Southeast. And so we'll move on to what you came here for today, which is high tunnels. And, um, and I'll go through just a brief definition and then I'll talk about the NRCS high tunnel program. Um, so from, from, from our perspective, a high tunnel is a seasonal covered structure that's used to extend the growing season. And it's intended for use um, over the ground. So crops that um, are grown in the ground or in established raised beds. So it's not a greenhouse because greenhouses is where you grow um, food in containers or on tables. Um, so this is the difference between a green, when we use the term greenhouse and when we use the term high tunnel. Um, a high tunnel, we're talking about plants that are grown directly in the soil profile. Um, and at least um, six foot high in the center. So the low um, hoops or row covers are, are not considered high tunnels. So that's the basic um, the basics of high tunnel definition for, for our purposes. We can move on to the next one. So just to reiterate, our programs, the NRCS programs, are oriented towards assisting people address natural resources concerns related to agricultural production. Um, we're not really in the business of, of actively assisting with production. However, this, you know, you can't, you can't really deny that this helps people grow food and this is something I think that literally came top down um, from the White House trying to encourage people to grow food locally. And it was uh, an initiative that um, sort of didn't quite fit with a lot of the other USDA programs. And so um, NRCS took it on and from, um, for us to make it fit within our original mission 
we um, approach it from the perspective that we're helping people um, control pests or that if they're using um, a lot of fertilizers or pesticides that you can reduce the need for those um, or at least be much more efficient in the application of those if you have a controlled environment. Um, and so that's how we kind of approach it from the you know, resource concern perspective. And, um, and of course with watering efficiency, which is maybe not so much of a concern here, although there are times when it's really dry, and of course, and, and in some cases, you know, a high tunnel can, can really help um, from having your, your uh, garden turn into a, a rice paddy at some point <laughs> during the growing season. And we, um, at first we were requiring people to also implement associated practices um, with the high tunnel, such as nutrient management or pest management or irrigation water management, um, which is we also provide some cost sharing on those because they do require um, some record keeping and ongoing maintenance. Um, but uh, now we, they're not necessarily required, but they're highly encouraged. And when we do take applications for the EQIP program, um, they're ranked according to a, a variety of different factors, but one of which is how many practices you're going to implement. And so if you only just have a high tunnel on your application, it ranks lower than somebody's who might include a high tunnel and cover crop and nutrient management um, or something like that. So, so uh, it's, it's something to keep in mind as you go through the application process if you're interested in applying. So we can move on to the next one. So the, the EQIP program that I referred to is called the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. And uh, we just refer to it as EQIP and it includes uh, funding for high tunnels through 2013, which is the year that our farm bill will be um, reviewed and hopefully reauthorized by, by Congress. But it is an election year, so we'll see how things go. Um, but it is a cost share program. It does not necessarily cover the entire cost of a high tunnel structure um, and or shipping it here and or installing it. So um, it's a cost share program. It is reimbursable. So you have to be able to um, purchase the structure and install it and then get paid back for it after it's been certified by us to meet uh, our specifications. And then it is considered a taxable benefit. So, and, and that's always something I try to tell people up front so that they're not surprised the following year when they get their um, IRS form and, or you know, their taxes and, and suddenly you know, they've got this extra thing that's, ta that's tacked on to their taxable income. Um, so it is considered a, a, a taxable benefit if you were to be funded by NRCS for a high tunnel and associated practices. We can move on. <clears throat> so one of the requirements, um, the requirements through the EQIP program for high tunnels is that we only cost share on manufactured structures. So um, no homemade structures are allowed to be cost shared on. And then the frame, again, must have a minimum center height of six feet and a maximum bow spacing. In other words, the, the ribs of the um, tunnel structure um, have a maximum spacing of four feet. And um, the covering has to be six mil plastic, greenhouse grade, UV resistant polyethylene. Um, we were requiring that people take the plastic off over the winter time, and we don't require that anymore, but there's definitely a risk at keeping the plastic on over the winter time because of snow loads, and we have had a couple of cases up north where um, folks decided to leave the plastic on and the snow loads got really heavy over the winter time and, uh, and the whole structure collapsed and then they were on the hook to replace their high tunnel out of their own pocket at that point. So um, if, if you end up leaving the plastic on, it's to your benefit to be um, active about removing snow throughout the winter time. <clears throat> And then you need to maintain that structure for at least four years. 
Our contracts are five years in length, so you need to maintain the structure for four of those five years. And then that last year is our sort of cushion for tithing purposes. Um, and our cost sharing is available for up to 2,178 square feet, which is a weird number, but I don't know how they came up with it. It's 5% of one acre. So if you want a 2,100 square foot, you know, high tunnel, that's, that's great. If you want, you know, one that's 1,000 feet, that's great. If you want three that are 1,000 feet each, then we'll only cost share up to that 21. 78 square feet. So it's kind of up to the applicant to decide how, you know, how they want to structure their own application and uh, um, put the high tunnels on their property. Um, the 2012 rate, which the rates don't necessarily change between years, but, um, but they have in the past. So um, for, I haven't seen the 2013 cost share rate, but the 2012 rate was seven dollars and thirty four cents per square foot, and so um, if you start doing the math and doing shopping, then that 's definitely going to factor in that 's what we pay if you can find it cheaper and have it shipped up cheaper, great for you <laughs> it does, doesn 't happen very often <laughs> i don 't know of any cases where it has happened but um, but uh, again, it is a cost share program, so it 's meant to offset the cost of it. And, um, and there are some record keeping required. With the high tunnel itself, it's not a whole lot of record keeping. It's basically soil and air temperature on a weekly basis. Um, if you add additional practices like nutrient management or pest management, there's additional rep record keeping um, and sampling and um, such that are required, but you also get an additional uh, cost share for doing those practices. So. In a lot of cases, it, it makes it worth your while um, to add those on. And we can move on to the next one. Okay, so how do you qualify for EQIP? The applicant um, can be an individual or a partnership or a corporation. Now, um, partnership is usually two people who own the same piece of property. Um, it gets a little more complicated when it's maybe an ad hoc organization or um, three or four people that don't necessarily own the property and and that's something that you know if you do find that you're interested then then we need to have a lot of talk <laughs> but um, units of government and political subdivisions thereof including school districts are not eligible for equip um, but there are ways to tackle that as well so um, so yet yeah, you just have to be a little bit creative um, and you do need to be able to certify self-certification process that you've been able to produce at least $1,000 worth of um, the terminology is food or fiber. So even if you're producing like cut flowers and the reason why they say fiber is basically for like um, linen or, you know, um, cotton producers down south. Um, so that that's where the terminology comes from. But basically $1,000 worth of agricultural products in the past year. And they, they put in a clause any two of the past five years in case you know, there's been you know, some catastrophic reason why you couldn't, um, or if you have crop rotation or um, some natural disaster happened or something like that. But um, it's, uh, it's generally not too hard for most people to uh, to self-certify that um, if you keep any type of gardening records or keep track of what you've produced in your garden. Um, it's usually pretty easy to compare that to uh, what it would cost you to purchase that same amount of food at the grocery store. So it's, it's a, a, little bit of a, um, a little bit of homework if, if you haven't been keeping records and that's part of the reason why we uh, take applications in June for the following year um, so that people do have one growing season to, to do that kind of homework if they haven't already been doing it. <clears throat> and it doesn't necessarily have to be commercial. It can be for um, personal use and, and for like feeding your own family. And then you also need to be able to certify that you have control of the land for the life of the contract. So 
Um, if you have your own property and you have a deed, then that's great. And then where you have like a lease agreement, that generally works. Even if it's a lease agreement on public land, that's okay too. Um, where it's sort of like a memorandum of an understanding or a memorandum of agreement with a separate landowner, that gets a little stickier, but, um, but it's still possible. So um, there are a variety of different ways to approach that as well. And we can move to the next one. So the land itself needs to also qualify. It needs to either be currently cultivated or have a history of cultivation or be capable of supporting crops. In other words, we're not in the business of helping people convert to a different land use. So clearing forest land or draining a wetland is not something that we'll cost share on. And we, and, we, and we go through a process of um, doing a wetland and highly erodible land determination on the land that's being applied for a high tunnel um, to ensure that a wetland has not been impacted um, in order to produce food and, um, and also to make sure that the soil is either not highly erodible or um, is being treated and managed in such a way that erosion is not a concern on that piece of property. So, um, and then also that it may not be, the land may not be already enrolled in other USDA conservation programs, which is not usually a problem here in Southeast, um, but it is something that, that people can run into depending on what they're doing. So we can go. So we um, accept applications continuously. You can submit an application at any time. And the application itself is very <coughs> cursory. There's not a whole lot on there besides putting your name and your social security or your tax ID number and answering a, a couple of really cursory questions. Um, we have a cutoff date for reviewing and funding those applications and our cutoff date is June 15th for the following fiscal year, which starts October 1st. So our cutoff date for last year was June 15th, 2011, and we're just now funding applications from, that were submitted last spring. Um, so that literally is how long it takes <laughs> um, to, uh, to, to submit an application and potentially get funded. Um, for program work and program cost sharing. Um, it does, you know, it allows you time to decide, you know, what do I want to do? Do I want to do a high tunnel only? Do I want to do nutrient management, irrigation water management? Do I have other resource concerns on my property that could be addressed? And it gives, gives us the growing season to work with you and develop a full project proposal that's then um, submitted in the fall, and then we wait for Congress to um, allocate funding to NRCS Alaska, and then our state office reviews all the applications that come in and um, begins selecting applications for funding usually in um, the winter of that, that following year. So it's June 15th is the cutoff date, and then working on your full project proposal throughout the summer. Um, and then usually by December or January, the state office is reviewing those applications. And then March and April is usually when they're uh, awarding funding. So that's, that's kind of how the, the cycle goes. And we can go to the next slide. So I can answer questions now. Do people have questions? OK. Thank you. All right. Um, so we don't have much time left for greenhouses, and as you may notice, I had a semester course in it, and I don't think I can cover that in 10 minutes. Is Dana still here? Okay, show of hands. Would you rather see a really quick presentation on greenhouses, or Dana, is it weeds? It's yeah, do you guys have any questions on invasive plants? Invasive plants. Dana is the coordinator of the invasive plant program. Greenhouses? Greenhouses. Greenhouse. Invasive plants. Dana has contact information on the back table. So if you have questions, contact her. Okay, so this is me. We all know me. 
Uh, greenhouses, to me, they're all about choices. I think of myself as a Luddite, but as soon as I'm in a greenhouse, I go, ooh. If you've ever been in a greenhouse in the winter, it's a whole new world. And um, size, it's all about money, because the bigger, the better. Um, then there are many other kinds of choices that you're going to have to make, and I want to talk about those kind of choices. Um, so there are basically the two styles of greenhouses. There's freestanding and attached, and then there's the choice of are you going to buy a kit or are you going to do it custom. Uh, for the frame, there's several different kinds of materials, and the glazing, that's actually what we think of as the glass, but most greenhouses are not glass anymore. And to me, by the way, the difference between a high tunnel and a greenhouse is that a greenhouse is on a permanent foundation. I've seen greenhouses where corn is grown in the ground, but I've done mostly research. So uh, these are the poly insul insulated polycarbonate panels. This is probably the most popular style right now. They actually are horizontal in that picture of the way you would put them on a greenhouse. And they have several layers with air in between. They're well insulated, they're durable, they don't tend to turn yellow in the sun. That's the most common choice these days for glazing. Other major design choices, knee walls. A lot of people will put a solid knee wall up to the height of the table because any light that comes in below that isn't likely to get to the plant anyway, and it's just more area that you need to heat. So if you can make that a permanent type of structure, it's a place to mount the heating and um, saves, saves on uh, inputs. Uh, once you have a knee wall, you can earth berm the outside up to that knee wall to help further with insulation. That was common in Wisconsin where I used to work. Um, you can use raised beds, plant in the ground, or have benches. And then the benches have many different options. You want to have, of course, at least one door. If you have a small greenhouse, one's better. And then you can put a bench at the far end across the end wall as well. And then you have to decide which way to put it towards the sun. And I don't have any really great insight into that. So here's some examples. Here's an A-frame, a very inexpensive style. Uh, this is called a Gothic arch, this system. And this is somewhere between a greenhouse and a high tunnel. The plastic comes off um, during parts of the growing season on that one. The Quonset hut is a familiar shape. The gazebo, and those come in many different fancy designs. A dome, if you want to get crazy, like the Milwaukee dome. And here's one up at Calypso Farms in Fairbanks. It is only oriented towards the south, and then there's a, a straight up and down wall on the north side. And this is somewhat of a greenhouse. To me, a greenhouse, you can stand up in it. That's why she says six feet. A bay window may be an option if you really have a small yard and nothing else, nowhere else to put one. Uh, and you can have it open to the room, or you can have it divided off to keep the humidity in it, but then it can be a heating issue. And there's a lean-to style with a knee wall. That's a masonry knee wall. And the gable style, again, attached to a house, more common maybe in Europe. And then the full-on solarium, if you're really a dreamer. They're very expensive, lots of options. You can have shading material that runs in tracks along each section and curtains. And, uh, you know, they can, you, can, you can live in there and then put up a potting shed for your toilet and your changing room and just live in the solarium. That would be my choice. So, um, ventilation. There's basically three choices. The manual, you just open the door, the windows. This is what Sandy Williams does. When it gets warm enough, he opens the door to his tomato greenhouse and starts them hardening off. Passive, there are vents that um, you, it has a cylinder with uh, paraffin wax in it that expands when it heats up. I have an example of one up here, plus there's a picture on the slideshow. And then active, that's for people with the more money, and it's uh, common in uh, commercial and research greenhouses, and there's just no end of money you can put into that. Swamp cooler is a box that has fiber in it that sets in water, and air gets drawn through it, and it cools air. Probably not that important in southeast, but it's one cooling system. Here's the passive vent opener. You could also put that on a low tunnel if you wanted to. Um, irrigation. Even some of the large commercial growers in Skagit Flats down in Washington Water by hand. You need a really good rose on the end of it. Some people, that's all they do. All day, every day is water by hand. And the reason they do it that way is because when you're watering by hand, um, it, you can compensate for any uh, lack of uniformities, but also you're looking at every plant. When diseases happen in the greenhouse and pests come in, it happens very quickly. And when you're watering by hand, you have a lot of time to notice that stuff. And so a lot of the commercial growers will go with that. You can use overhead, but it's too uniform. You still want to check to see if you need to hand water somewhere. Drip is a very good option, especially if you have hanging baskets along the north side. They can be difficult to hand water. 
Drip's a good option for that. Ebb and flow is pretty fancy. That's where you have a bench that you flood and then let the water out again. Floors, gravel floors, they're good and bad. You can have just a permanent perimeter wall and have gravel in the middle. But greenhouses, the pests take off very quickly and that gives them one more place to hide. Um, if you can put earth fabric over the gravel floor, that will help you out quite a bit. You really need to stay on top of the weeds and of course soil eventually drops down in there and makes more spots for weeds to grow and bugs to hide. Concrete floors are really the cat's meow, but not everyone can afford them. The lighting, there is an excellent publication that you can download from the extension website. It's listed here and it discusses all these different options. Heating, thermal mass is a, is a passive way of keeping heat in your greenhouse. And basically you, basically you take the old barrels that lots of different kinds of food stuff come in and you can buy them used sometimes. I don't know if anyone in town has them right now. The size of an oil barrel, you fill it with water Hopefully it's black, but even if it's blue, it helps a whole lot, absorbs the sun's rays, and then releases that heat again at night. And if you plan it right, you can use them as the base for your tables. Oh, and one more thing I wanted to say about the tables. If you have a larger greenhouse, you don't want too much space. The space is really expensive, and it's at a premium. And if you don't want too much space in alleyways, you have tabletops that are six feet wide. You put them on a permanent base that's four feet wide, and you set them up so they roll on pipes and you have only one alley and then you roll the tables whichever way you need to to get between them and that's one way to save a lot of space in a larger greenhouse. So then there are of course other options too for heating. Animals, pests, it's good and bad. They all want to be there because it's the best spot on earth and they explode very quickly, their numbers explode very quickly, but it's also in some ways easier to control them. If you want to use the chemicals or some sort of bomb, you have a contained space to do it in. Everything's fairly concentrated. It's a comfortable place to be if you're going through and picking off bugs. It's not like kneeling on the ground out in the rain. And then I've seen several different options with livestock. In Elk City, Idaho, very, very cold place, I've seen people raising rabbits underneath the tables in their greenhouse. And of course, the rabbits eat the greenhouse scraps. They use the manure from the rabbits in their compost and the rabbit bodies help to some degree to heat the greenhouse. Fowl, like guinea hens, are small enough to be in a greenhouse. And then for ornamental choices, I've seen fish that have actual tube where they can go inside a pond in the house, out to the greenhouse, out to the outside, and doors where you can close them in between if you really want to have fun with your greenhouse. And this, I didn't want to fail to mention this. This is out of a university publication. And this is the way to really make use of space in the greenhouse if you're growing cucumbers and tomatoes. This is from a cucumber publication, but you can do the same thing with tomatoes. And tomatoes are actually uh, semi-perennial. You can keep them going for quite a while. If you, there's two types, the indeterminate and the ter determinate. And if you get an indeterminate style plant, it's different varieties. Hopefully you can find that in your seed book. You can, you can get them to be really big. So basically, they're growing up to, you have a pipe across the top that holds strings, and there are clips specially made for this. You grow your stem up, pinching off the side branches. So it grows as a single one. When it gets to the top, you split it and let it drape again down both sides. And vertical growing is an extremely efficient use of space. So um, I've been neglecting to thank people this whole series. And so here's a slide of people that I would like to thank. And uh, don't have much time to go through any of this. It's quitting time. But, and here, here are a few upcoming events related to the Master Gardeners. And this is a list of the publications that you can download. Some of them are quite large. I have examples up here. But th th they're really excellent. This one, Controlling the Greenhouse Environment, it sounds kind of boring, but it really isn't. It covers all kinds of different systems for the greenhouse really well. And um, this cucumber one has those pictures that I just showed you. And uh, the tomato production one doesn't, doesn't talk about that, but be it known that you can do that with tomatoes as well. Um, I think that's the last slide.